Welcome to How Hard Could It Be, where I make a YouTube video then talk about some of my challenges in the process. In my video about the layers of the suffering, I mentioned an interview with Richard Rouse. He was the project lead, the lead designer, and the writer of The Suffering. Here's that interview now. Hopefully you'll enjoy the discussion. Oh, and while you listen, why don't you do the poll in the description or pin a comment down below and tell me what you'd like to see me make next. Either way, sit back, relax, and enjoy. I guess I'll start out with, uh, what was it like working within the confines of this game world? Prisons aren't a setting most games take place in, even in the horror genre. What made you want to put a game in this setting? This game in this setting? Yeah, it, it was... We decided early on to do a horror game. Um, and Midway was interested in a horror game, and we thought we could do one. And uh, none of us had made one before. But we thought, this is cool. And so we did a bunch of like brainstorming and came up with uh, a pitch that as I was writing it up after the sort of brainstorming meeting, I was like, hey, guys, we just designed Silent Hill. Uh, and it was a little too close. And then this one guy on the team, Steve, uh, an artist at the time, um, had suggested a prison as a setting, some sort of haunted prison. And um, so that idea then bubbled back up and we basically threw out the first pitch and then went with the, the haunted prison instead. And, you know, I wasn't an expert on prisons at the time or anything, but as a game setting, it seemed like, as a game setting for a horror game, it seemed like so good that, why has no one done this before? Um, for a few reasons. Like, obviously, from a purely um, spooky places to go uh, sort of standpoint, right? Like, a lot of people don't want to be in prison because they're, you know, people don't really even know what goes on inside them often. It just seems like this horrible place you would never want to go. And I always liked the idea of making the horror game of combining, you know, supernatural stuff that's horrible, um, but placing that in a place that is also horrible. So you're sort of making it double horrible, which is contrast with, like, say, Silent Hill, which is, say, like a small, you know, Americana kind of town that has gotten all spooky and sort of shows you how spooky it really is, sort of like a Stephen King story or something. Um, so it's sort of taking a place that we think of as safe and beautiful and making it scary. Here we're taking a place that's already scary and making it scarier. So I like that a lot. Um, and then just beyond sort of the just being a great place to set horror fiction, let alone a game, from a game standpoint, it was great because it explains why a lot of doors are locked and a lot of like pads are unavailable and why is there security everywhere? Like when you're making a game like Silent Hill, you either have to, uh, you know, let the player go a lot of places because it's just a town. Why can't I go over there? Why can't I go over there? Um, <clears throat> but and then they would come up with supernatural reasons or there's a fire, or there's a car crash or something. Eventually, you, you know, it's, it makes it more, it makes your life more difficult to have to constantly explain when, particularly when you're making a linear game, which the suffering was. Um, but for the most part, it was a little more open than many other linear games, but it was still, I would call it a linear game. Um, it, it, it's handy to have that justification for you can't go that way because the door's locked or there's fencing or there's razor wire or, or whatever it is. So, uh, it just was like those two things combined. And I always think about that when I think of making games of like, does it work both just as a pure story, but does it also work in terms of what gameplay we're going to try to do there? So it makes sense in a lot of ways, just for justifications for the mechanics and the puzzles that you encounter through the game. Sure, exactly. Like one of the ones that kind of stood out to me is the, uh, the one where you have to block, unblock a door and then block the other door because it's a double gate system. Right, yeah, yeah. And that was, uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing that would be possible in a prison setting that would not make any sense for just a house or something like that. Right, so. right. So you mentioned uh, Stephen King, um, and I get heavy, heavy The Shining vibes from Carnate Island at times. Uh what were some of the things that had an influence on your designs during development? Yeah. So in terms of like non game inspirations, um, you know, I did like Stephen King, particularly his, his short, short fiction, um, some of his short story collections. I like a lot. Um, 
you know, I was a huge fan of The Shining, the movie, which is very different than The Shining, the book. Uh, and Stephen King has always hated the movie, strangely. Um, don't, get, don't, I, don't get me started. I don't. I don't. <laughs> the, en- and then the ending he, you of know, that he, movie he, just bothers he, me. What, the ending of the movie bothers you? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think it's a... I like everything about that movie. I have no complaints. Um, and it's like he remade it as a date for TV thing at one point. Stephen King did because yeah. he's like, oh, they ruined it. And my TV thing's better. Very few people think that his TV thing is better than the, the Shining movie. Like, the Shining movie is very, it's a Kubrick thing more than it's a Stephen King thing at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, which is cool if you're into Kubrick stuff. Uh, but. Uh, anyway, so I like that. There were a few other. I made a list of five horror movies that I saw as like these are the ones were um, that I was drawing inspiration from, and I, I would share them with other members of the team and stuff. But The Shining was one. Um, Psycho was one. Um, the Birds was one. So two Hitchcock films, and then uh, Rosemary's Baby, that Roman Polanski movie, and. I think that's right. Those four, and then the fifth one was, and the shot. All right, that's one, two, three, four. All right, that's four, and then um, uh, the Japanese version of the Ring, um, that was was not yet had not yet been remade as a Hollywood film at that point, um, and I, I had seen that at a film festival or something, and like it hadn't gotten a proper U.S. release, but it was. Uh, I just remember seeing it, and it was the first like modern Japanese horror thing I'd seen and was like, oh my god, this is totally different than what we're expecting. Um, you know, other members of the team, I remember there was, what was it called? The House on Haunted Hill or something. Um, it was a, it was a, one of the sort of mainstream Hollywood uh, horror films at the time. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but that was like something a bunch of the team was inspired by, uh, but less me. I, I was not into sort of mainstream horror movies at that time. I feel like they've come a long way since then. Um, but a lot of the ones that were coming out in that era of like early 2000s weren't ones I liked very much. Um, so it was more going back to those older films and the, and the Japanese films um, to get some inspiration, which was funny because we were making, you know, we, th- we referred to it as an American horror game because so many of the horror games people were getting were, were Japanese, uh, which was, and those are great games like Silent Hill or, or Resident Evil series. Um, but, you know, obviously they're culturally different than, than what an American team would make. So we just saw that as a way to differentiate ourselves. Um, so those are some of the inspirations in terms of films. Um, you know, I was also inspired by a lot of nonfiction stuff like uh, Dead Man Walking, the the book, which was also made into a movie, but I'd read the book. And um, uh, New Jack was a book about prisons that I liked a lot, made by a journalist who had who had taken a job as a prison guard for a year or two, I think, just to sort of, because it's really hard to get information on how prisons work from the outside, or you hear stories, but they're all, you know, they're told by one side or the other. They're either told by the state or they're told by the prisoners and both have their own um, biases. biases, right? So this book was trying to take a journalistic look at, you know, what's it like inside a prison, really, and... Uh, I just thought it was good because, you know, he went in as a corrections officer and was both surprised by both sides, like, you know, how hard a job it was and how what a hard time the guards were having, but then also how, you know, a lot of the inmates were really messed up and, and in a bad situation themselves. So I think I felt like he had sympathy for both sides of this bad situation, often inside prisons. Pretty, um, pretty nuanced look. You know, yeah, I liked on both it was sides by, of the coin. Yeah, it was Ted Conover is the name of the author who did that. Uh, New Jack, uh, I think, was the name of the book. Um, so anyway, so that yeah, so a bunch of nonfiction stuff I read as well, uh, and then in terms of games, our original inspiration was probably more than anything else Half Life actually, um, which was you know again very different than like Silent Hill as well. But even like in terms of the gameplay, uh, Half Life, and originally the game didn't have any cutscenes, and those were added later, um, as we realized we could benefit from them. 
Um, I think the Midway, someone at the publisher really wanted us to add them, so we tried it out and decided they, they did work pretty well. Um, but we'd liked Half-Life a lot, and it was we were PC game developers more than we were console game developers. So, um, and Half-Life, it always felt like it was a, you know, sort of an action movie with some horror elements. So now we're making a horror game with action elements. So it's just moving the needle a little farther. And I, I remember reading on a... Uh... I remember reading on Wiki, on the Wikipedia, that it was really important for you guys to have that solid gameplay, the solid gameplay mechanics, um, even though it might detract from the horror elements of the game. You want to make a solid game and then add the, the spooky in, so to speak. Yeah, or specifically, we didn't want you to be a weak character. Um, cause a lot of horror games had built on like, you move really slowly or you turn badly or your aim is terrible. And we were coming from a place of, could we make it where you still feel like a cool, powerful, you know, able to shoot your guns character thing, like, like you would find in Half-Life, um, or Max Payne or something at the time. And, you know, could we take that and then add enough horror to it that it felt like a horror game, but still felt like an action game as opposed. So it was, you know, I would refer to it as action horror instead of survival horror. Sometimes the so survival horror, you know, you've got no resources, you're out of bullets, you know, you're just trying to, to barely get by all the time. Uh, and here it was, you can get by, but boy, there's a lot of, a lot of these supernatural creatures that you need to take care of. So, so, uh, Jumping off of the supernatural creatures, what was the enemy development like? How many iterations of certain creatures were there when you were linking them with these methods of execution? Yeah, that really came down to originally um, there was an artist at Surreal called Ben Olson who uh, had been there through the Draken games that the studio had done before, which were obviously fantasy titles, and he had done... Uh, character work, but also just 3D modeling and stuff. And we knew that he had a pretty weird, like when you would see the stuff he would do for himself, it was pretty out there, you know, creepy kind of comics sort of stuff. And we just thought, hey, this, and we had him and there's this other character artist, Aaron Coberly, who was also excellent, but was maybe less naturally predisposed to that sort of creepy work on in his personal stuff. So we just saw it as this, well, what if we just let Ben draw some stuff? And that was really, you know, as the game was taking shape before we even knew we were going to associate all the characters with the lethal uh, execution methods, um, capital punishment methods. Um he, ben was just drawing stuff, and I remember he drew a bunch of things um, that didn't get used in that period too, but a few that did. And the first, the first thing he drew that we looked at and said, "Yeah, that thing was uh, what turned out to be the Slayer character in the game, who's that sort of the the first enemy, the first you know monster you see, um, the one with the blades for limbs and stuff." and he was originally called the cartwheeler because in the concept art he drew, he was doing cartwheels. Um, so it was a little weird. And so we backed away from the cartwheeling idea, but he did, he did keep up that sort of gymnast, you know, he could jump on the ceiling and he could walk on all fours or on two legs and, and he could move at different speeds. Um, that all sort of came out of those early sketches he did. And maybe he didn't end up doing the cartwheeling. Um, and, you know, then he, he once, once we liked that character, then we kind of had a style and future characters flowed out of that. And then we got the idea maybe after we had two characters or something of, hey, what if they were all themed to a capital punishment um, sort of methods of execution? And then that sort of ended up driving other characters that we wanted to do. Um, I remember, like, the, the second character you meet is the marksman. I believe that's it. yes. Uh, you sort of right. the first the first creature you meet is is the the cartwheeler, aka the slayer, and then you see like a bigger version of him, uh, which never had a separate name. It was just a bigger slayer, and then in the basement you find the marksman, if I recall correctly, and um, he was actually added. He was one of the last characters done when we realized we should have one who's a firing squad who can shoot projectile weapons because we didn't have enough projectile enemies. We decided. Um, and then that was like, you know, by then the character art was, was 
the style was decided and we were like, hey, it should be themed after Firing Squad. So he was able to like work the blindfold into it and stuff. Um, and so it's, it, it went different ways depending on the characters is I guess what I'm saying. Some were like, hey, Ben drew this thing. How can we use this? And then some were, uh, hey, could you draw something like this? And then and then he would or, or Aaron Coberly, the other, uh, the other artist would. Um, and that led to those those different characters that you see in there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, the, I really like the marksman. Um, the design on him with the, the turret on the back is definitely a really mm-hmm, mm-hmm. weird and interesting design. I really like that one. Yeah. I like the yeah. One, but marksman is just really pretty good standout. The mainliner is probably still one of my favorites. Um, like they're, they're less useful as an enemy type. You know, because they're more confined and where you can use them, and they're kind of the small, annoying thing. But just as a as a graphic design, um, I just love the lethal injection needles in the vac, and that he pulls them off and throws them at you, and and you know that he's sort of got the deformed lower half. Um, that was always a. I mean, I like them all as well, but uh, that was always a favorite. Which was which one was the hardest to implement, like mechanically in the game? Well, um, the Slayer does the most stuff. So making a creature who could go on the ceiling, you know, in terms of game development terms, means you have to make pathfinding that's also on the ceiling. You know, because in a game you often are defining where can characters go and where can't they go, and that usually involves designers setting up level markup in the game. So if you're going to say, hey, we've got level markup on the floor for most of the characters. Oh, and there's this one guy who can go on the ceiling. Well, now you have to do markup on the ceiling as well. And the programmers had to mate it so he could decide, when am I going to go on the ceiling or not? How's my behavior going to be different up there? And then he had to have different attacks from the ceiling so he could swipe down at you while he was up there. Um, but yeah, I think it, it worked. It definitely worked out that so much time was put into that character because he's so ubiquitous throughout. You know, he's the guy you see at the beginning and you just keep seeing him and you see the different variations of him uh, later in the game. So he was probably the most work. The one that was maybe the most difficult to solve was um, just as a creative uh, proposition was the um, what's called what I call the black one, who's the creature you fight at the end. Um, which is sort of the the final boss guy who's jumps up on the dock and and has weird capabilities and that just went through so many versions of it. it's like no that's not right no that's not right he and Ben was just drawing and drawing I think Aaron drew some and Ben drew some um, and what's what what's it gonna do and how is it gonna be cooler than the other ones that was the one we were the most stuck on and I think it worked out pretty well in the end but yeah. Uh, you know, it definitely didn't like many of the other characters. You know, once we had a, a design or a sort of a creative direction for it, it like they came together pretty much as planned. Whereas that one, just I, I think there were other versions of it that we threw out and stuff um, before we got that creature working. Pretty cool. And you said your favorite was the mainliner. One of my favorites. Yeah. Where did the insanity mode come from? Was that brought on through initial place testing, or was it always a plan mechanic? Yeah, that wasn't there from day one, um, but pretty early, like in the first three months or something, where I just didn't know if there was enough for the player to do without it. And that was what led me to think we should add another thing. Because, you know, we had, okay, the player can run around, they can have, you know, a shotgun, a pistol, a uh, uh is there another projectile weapon? There's a flamethrower. Anyway, oh, yeah. so a bunch of weapons. Um, you can do a wield the weapons, you know. Uh, you can do melee attacks with the, the shiv. Um, and then the fire axe later on. So there was like, okay, we've got this base set. Okay, he can do he can roll around a little bit. You know, he doesn't really crouch in the first game. Um, that's cool. But then it was like, I just want another thing for the player to be able to do in the game like just you know to you know like max Payne, for example to, to give another example that we were thinking of the time it has bullet time right which makes perfect sense for that game and is great and it's like you know, you've got your core shooting plus this other thing um and so this was hey what if we did uh you know and then that dovetailed with 
the idea that Torque's sanity was in question, which was there from the beginning, and the amnesia thing was there from the beginning. Um, so it made sense that, oh, he has a creature that is, you know, him losing control in some way that you can then use, but you shouldn't overuse or you might die yourself. Um, so that was, yeah, that was added pretty early on, but uh, that's kind of where it came from. You mentioned uh, Torque's sanity. Um, Torque's in-game morality to deciding his past was a really interesting decision. It puts him in this quantum lock situation where your actions decide not only his actions, but also those of others in his life as well. How did you come to the decision to make this a reality? Yeah, that was there from the very early pitch as well. And I don't remember exactly where it came from. Um, but I like games that you know let the player make choices and then that alters the story. And obviously we could do that without the changing the backstory as well but it always just it you know from that early time when we had the idea of you know maybe you can make choices in the story and maybe that determines whether you're guilty of the crime you're in prison for like that was a very early idea and was just like yes that thing is great um and it's not so much a you know i never thought of it in science fiction terms i more thought of it as the truth of torque you know his backstory was true the whole time it's just you don't know what it is, and then your actions determine what it is, but it was always true. You know, it's not like a time-traveling paradox or anything like that. It's more just a, you're revealing what Torque's story is for you, right? Um, including things that happened before you got there. Um, and it just felt like that was that way, you know, the beginning of the game was deliberately written to, like, say, well, we he's supposed to have done this, but did he or not? And um, so we're, since we had that idea from the very beginning, it was really fundamental to everything we did in terms of the story after it. Um, Cause so, you know, often you can have an idea that's cool like that later in development and then you have to like try to squeeze it in. And then some of the stuff you've done already has to be thrown out or you decide to keep some of it, even though it doesn't completely fit. And now you're, you're um, trying to shoehorn an idea in that's maybe not the best way to do it. But in, in that case, we had it there from the start and, just like the idea that you not only determine your future, but also your past. Cool. So uh, there's a kind of concept of like the death of the author, audience interpretation versus what the author in, uh, intended for the story. Um, so I got some couple questions about that. Mm -hmm. Was there a you can't save everyone aspect of the narrative? Was that a message you were trying to get across with some of the cutscenes? especially for the escort characters and things like that. Yeah, I, I saw your question in the list, and that was one of the ones I, I tried to refresh my memory on before. Um, but, yeah, of the characters, because there's the first character you meet is that aggressive guard um, who shouts at you, and he dies pretty quickly. If you, if, he, if you don't kill him yourself, he gets killed by the electric chair room. Um, and he was never, he was, it's funny that that character is remembered so much by people because he was never one of the principal characters to me. He was always like some guard you meet at the beginning. But the guy who did the, the voice performance for him, John Patrick Lowry, uh, was really good. And, and we ended up like adding a little more to him along the way. But he doesn't even have a name or anything. He's just, you know, prison guard or something in the script. Um, anyway, so he dies. But then later in the game, you have six other characters that you meet. Uh, Dallas, um, who you can save, and then Luther, who you can save at first, um, and when you leave him, it looks like he's okay. And then Sergey, who you think you save. I mean, all these characters, you never know what happens after you leave them, but um, but they they might be okay, they might not. But Sergey, you you get him hooked up with his stuff, he survives. Then um, it's the next one. Right, the next one is Clem, right, with his um, raft, right. and you can get the raft going, and he survives, and es he escapes the island, as far as you can tell. Um, you know, maybe he drowns out in, in the crossing the, the ocean, but uh, maybe not. Uh, and then you've got Jimmy, who does die when you meet Hermes. Um, and then you've got Ernesto, who, if you do the right thing, gets sent off to the town, and you don't know what happens to him either. Um, so actually, in balance of those six characters... Uh, it's only, and then, yeah, right, it turns out when you go back to the, 
prison later and go to the room where Luther was, I believe you see his dead body. Um, cause you left him there after getting him there, but then the, it's implied that he was killed later on. Um, so you can't, you can't save Luther. You can't save Jimmy, but I think you can save the other four. So I tried, I mean, it's, and it was difficult to do that. And it, I wanted it to be something where, you know, if you did well, you got a real reward, which was these characters not being dead. Um, a real narrative reward that is, uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, obviously, you know, one third of them are dead still. So there is some amount of, yeah, you can't save everybody. And I think in any kind of, you know, again, the combination of the horror setting and the prison setting, that's to be expected, right? You know, it's pretty rare in a horror movie where, you know, the cast characters you meet at the beginning are all alive at the end. Um, and similarly, you know, people die in prisons at a higher rate than they die uh, in the real world. But, you know, the whole game is about death and stuff so it, it only makes sense that not everyone's going to make it right uh torque was he meant to represent prison violence in the way other monsters in the game represent other methods of execution i mean um i mean prison violence is a very sort of amorphous like a kid and car incorporate all kinds of things like you know from getting shiv to getting killed in other worse ways um, or getting killed by the state via, you know, uh, capital punishment. Um, so I didn't necessarily see him as representing that. I saw him more as the, I really saw him as the players being inserted into this scenario and what you make of Torque is up to you. So if you interpret him that way, then that's great. But I would think other players would interpret him another way and that's fine too, as far as I'm concerned. And I feel that way in general about, you know, players interpreting the story that they encounter in the game. However, whatever they bring to it is correct because they're bringing it to it and it deliberately leaves a lot to the imagination. Um, it creates a, a world that has certain fixed things, but other things that are never explained. And then I love hearing what audiences think of when they try to fill in those things. Yeah, because I was replaying and I used some time at work to rewatch throughout the whole game. And I kind of had one of those epiphanies of like, is that what he's supposed to represent? Because, you know, you have the two characters that were directly executed and or Hermes who chose to, you know, be executed by himself. And they are direct representations of those aspects. Um, so I was thinking, you know, maybe Torque is supposed to mean that because, you know, he has that back history of... Uh, his backstory with the Aryan Brotherhood that's mentioned at the start. Mm. Um, or, yeah, or that's the rumor anyway. Yeah. And so. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I never, I don't think of uh, when I'm writing, I don't think to that level of symbology, I guess. Um, like certain things, yes, but more servicing just the story than some larger commentary thing. Um, though I think it ends up doing that still, but I'm not, it's not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about, does it make sense that this character would do this and how interesting it's this and, you know, wanting to bring up subjects like capital punishment or prisons or whatever. Like I want to engage in those subjects and present them in an interesting way, but I'm not thinking, you know, this means this exact thing, or the fact that you find this at this point means this. It's more, does that make sense in the context of the characters and, and what they're going through? Um, and then I love it, again, when people interpret that stuff like you are doing. Um, or uh, The funniest one I wrote was, I read was um, an academic paper. I think it was a chapter in a book, maybe, where someone talked about and this is really getting out there, you know, in the game, you can switch between third person and first person. And they talked about how that symbolized, you know, the detachment from reality or something that you could go from being third person to first person. And what did that mean? And I, I, I thought that was really interesting and totally not my intention at all. My intention was, wouldn't it be cool to look at stuff without the character in the way sometimes? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, cool. Oh, let's add a little more features to it. Okay. Oh, I guess it's a first person mode. Okay, that's cool. Uh, it's not but, just... It's not you supposed know, when to the, represent he's disassociating in the moment. Right. But the fact that someone, you know, but when artists create stuff, not to sound too pretentious, but 
they're they're often not thinking of those things but that doesn't mean that the subconscious isn't thinking of them in some way so who's to say that that wasn't the reason i put it in subconsciously right might have or other people on the team might have suggested it for their own subconscious reasons right so um I'm I'm a very open. I don't. I know some creators get mad when they see interpretations. They're like, "That's not what I meant at all." And I I take the opposite of like, "Oh, that's cool. You think that?" And sure, go on thinking that. And I, who am I to say, right? You know, the I feel like this is true of all creations, but games even more so. Is it kind of doesn't really exist until the player plays it, and that's when it really exists. You know, because you're making choices and interpreting and all of that. So you're sort of completing the work uh, that that the development team started. Um, so complete it how you want. <laughs> uh, you mentioned commentary uh, a couple sentences ago. Mm-hmm. Was the game supposed to be a commentary on the way prisons and the incarcerated are handled in America? Or was that just collateral damage in the process of creating a game in this setting? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I guess there's, you know, when you're creating a piece of fiction of any in any genre, and you set it somewhere that is, you know, a real place, and and try to make it real in certain ways. Obviously, there's lots of unreal stuff about the game too, but you know, you kind of can't help but have some kind of commentary on it. But then, on the other hand, you know, there are some books or movies or games that like have a real message. You know, that are like, I'm making this movie to show how bad you know the country was 50 years ago and how this one court chase case fixed everything or whatever and these people are clearly villains and these people are clearly good people um and that's fine too but that's not the kind of stuff i tend to make i tend to make things where you know you as a player character are maybe dubious in your motivations and the people who are your allies have their own shortcomings but then the people who are villains maybe you know maybe they have a point maybe they there's some reason they turned out like this um like when you meet horace for example the electric chair um character in the game obviously he's you know has done these awful things to his wife that led to him being sentenced and um is you know killing people who come to the electric chair room and stuff he's not not a good dude the other hand he's got this story of why he did it all and and it kind of makes sense in his you know he's got mental health issues it sounds like and um uh versus say hermes who's more of a pure sadist he's probably the most villainous of anybody in the game um Anyway, just trying to keep each of those characters, or Killjoy, you know, for example, who's so full of himself and his ego that, you know, he's like, thinks he's saving all these people who he's actually ends up torturing. Um, But he, you know, but he remains sort of your weird ally, particularly like in the second game. Um, So it's it's a funny thing to try to balance these characters are doing bad things, but have like at least a glimpse of a good motivation for some, some, some of the things they do. Um, so getting back to your question, you know, is there a message per se? Like, I don't see it that way. Um, but of course you can interpret that way. And it's sort of, I try to create a space that presents something that maybe people don't think about. Like in, in society, we tend to try not to think about prisons much at all you know other than oh god i don't want to go there um and then once people are in there we forget about them pretend they're you know assume they're all horribly guilty when many of them aren't um you know and some of the characters bring up things like that about being wrongly convicted or 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 whatnot you never know if they're you know everybody you know they always say almost everybody inside is wrongly convicted right but some of them actually are um and so just bringing that up and making you see oh you know, when you meet Jimmy or something like that, or Dallas, you know, they're characters who you can say, this guy seems okay. He doesn't seem like a terrible person. Um, or Torque himself. Obviously, you're playing the, the part of a character who's being sent to death row, and you can't remember if you did the crime or not. Like, that's an awful situation to be in for someone. Um even if they do turn out to be guilty because they can't remember doing it. So it's it's try to bring those issues up and then let the audience think about it and decide what they're going to decide for your interpretation how much of it is in torque said is the beast mode in his head or is it supposed to be taken as fact 
I know that in the first game, it's not really commented on by any of the characters you team up with. But the second game, I did watch. Get I did watch through almost I think three or four hours of it, and some of the characters do comment on it in that game. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we you know the whole plot of the second game. I don't know if you've played it through, um, but that's more calling into like the plot ends up calling into tor- question Torque sanity more. Um, you know, in terms of who the the, the villain is and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I I choose not to say, <laughs> and that was the plan. The plan was always to not say, and I have a theory about what I think it is. But to me, like explaining it would just make it less cool. So your secret. <laughs> anyway, you know what is the truth, right? Your your truth can be as valid as mine. Once you know you're completing the game, do you think it's all in his head or not? Me, I, it's really hard to say because the way the, all the mechanics work together, but part of me says that I think it just, the, the beast mode itself is in his head, but he's actually like managing to cleave through these things in a brief moment of blackout. Right. Like it's just his, his own blackout rage, but in the, the second game, it's kind of a little bit more weebly wobbly. Like, I think I got up to, I was listen watching it at work and uh i got up to the the fight with the big bad um blackmore and so it's kind of like uh, is it in his head is it not in his head is this him just handling his inner demons mm-hmm. um you'll get to keep wondering <laughs> What parts of the game and story stuck with you, either during creation or after completion? I know for me it was just the general atmosphere. I'm not a, I'm not the biggest horror nut, but I really enjoy a good spooky story. And I know some of the scares and general atmosphere of the game really stuck with me. Yeah, the um, certainly for me, I remember sort of outside the game, I guess, some of the early, you know, those early character designs that Ben did when they came together, and it was like, oh, yeah, that. Or the first time he drew a picture of... Like, often when you make games with big teams, the main character is a real source of contention, and you change him a hundred times to try to make him better. But in this case, like, Ben drew a sketch of the main character, basically done, (laughs) and is like, here we go. And I'm like, yes, let's make that guy. And then we just made that guy and barely touched him. Um, and everyone liked him. Um, so that that was cool. Um, so that sticks with me. And I still have some of his original art framed on my wall. But uh, um, other than that, those those parts um, and the, you know, I really liked Carmen, uh, Tork's wife, and how she turned out both as a character and as the voice actor who did the performance. Uh, Rafita Keys was excellent. And um, it was tricky to find her for a little bit, you know, looking at actors, but she was just so perfect for it. Um, and then I remember, like, one of my favorite scenes in the game is there's a scene where you see Carmen at a gazebo out back of the asylum. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That's probably my favorite bit in the game. Um, just like that speech she does there and the memory and the environment and how it played in and stuff like that. So, um yeah, that's that's probably the main thing, and that is a funny story about Carmen. Is she originally didn't appear in the game? Um, she had a voice only that would show up in in certain memory flashbacky things, um, and you had those. I don't know if you remember when you play the game. You it's sometimes a couple of times during the game, about ten times during the entire game, he will. Torque will quickly lose consciousness and a little video will play that shows scenes from his apartment where the the crime took place. And that's him slowly remembering what happened in the apartment um, over the course of the game. Um, Originally, that was the only place Carmen showed up was in those videos. And those were pre-rendered, not real-time things. So we didn't have a character model for Carmen or the kids in the game until 
you know, the last four months or something when it was decided, hey, we're going to delay the game a little bit. What could we add in this time that would get the most benefit? And then we were able to, maybe it was, it was a little long, maybe it was six months or something, but it was, okay, we have time to build these characters. Let's build them and go back to the voice studio and do some new recording of, of Carmen and the kids. And... Um, really implement them in the game better and then yeah actually then you can see them in the game and you see them in those little flashbacks and, and stuff um and it's hard to imagine that we almost shipped the game without that stuff because it's so critical right it's like oh my god the game without that just it falls apart um to me anyway um so that was you know that coming together and yeah in particular that gazebo scene um was huge What's your favorite ending? Not necessarily the can- canonical one, but what's your favorite ending? <laughs> well, they're all canonical. Um, if you, I don't know if you know, but in the second game, it actually starts from whichever ending you got from the first game. Like, searches for your, mem- your save game and tries to figure it out. Um, so if you played it, like, on the same system. I don't know if it works on the PC, to be honest, but on the PS2 and the Xbox, it worked. Because um, the PC ports were done by another studio. Uh, and I don't know if they got that to work or not, but, um, so yeah, I don't, uh, again, there's no favorite, <laughs> there's no, it's whichever one you get, you got, and that's what it is. And I don't even, I try not to refer to them as the good ending or the bad ending. Cause it's like, this is the ending you earned. You get to decide what you think about it. Were you worried the game wouldn't be received well? Sure. Yeah, it was, um. I think whatever. Yeah, when I think that's it. That grips me with terror every time I make a game. It's like, what if this doesn't go well? And I, I think now, you know, in in more modern projects I've worked on at at big studios anyway, you have more testing and usability, and you get like you know people consultants come in and tell you what they think about it, and you just have more opportunities for people to give you their opinions um but you know it was funny like too at midway that we were not the favorite game that midway was putting out in that six month period um and we ended up doing like reviewing and and uh selling a lot better than the other games um which was a surprise (laughs) to me i guess and i didn't yeah i didn't know how it was gonna go and at some point, you just get so close to it that you you can't know anymore, and you just and you're also just so exhausted from working on it that you just like, well, we're done. <laughs> like, can't work on it anymore. Let's see what happens. I guess they don't like it. Well, there you go. Or they do like it. Oh, that's cool. You know, especially in that era of game where they don't have all the modern patches that we do now. Right. You just kind of I mean, you ship yeah. it and you abandon it basically. Yeah. Oh, and the other funny thing, I was just talking to some friends about this. Back then, you would ship it, but it was also like several weeks to a month before it would come out because they had to send the disc to manufacturing, and that would take a while. And you still do that for. Uh, you know, big console releases where you have to put a version on a disc. But like you say, you keep working on the patch, the day one patch. What what game doesn't have a day one patch at this point? Um, of of some stuff you just want to get in at the last minute, and then you think, well, we didn't fix that, but we'll fix that in the next patch or whatever. And you, you're constantly thinking of that. Whereas, yeah, that Xbox original Xbox PS2 era was the last time that patches weren't a thing, and. Uh, you really, I remember making changes like two days before the gold master went off, you know, gold master being the term for like the final disc, um, changing stuff in the game and being like, this is a really bad idea, but I really got to fix this. <laughs> like no one's going to notice this, but me right now, but I think the players will. So I'm going to make this change, you know, and just being right there in the tools doing it and maybe not telling other people on the team I was doing it and stuff. Cause I didn't want them to freak out, but it was like, we got to fix this thing. Oh my God. Um, kind of that, so that yeah. paranoia that the players are gonna, a lot of players will like go through and purposely try and break things in the game. Yeah, or just you know they play it in a way that's different than how you as the development team play it. You as the development team very rarely play it through start to finish. You play this level or this level. Um, you know you're testing this one thing you just did, and that requires you to play it for 20 minutes. It doesn't require you to play it for 10 hours or whatever, right? So. Right. How many people have played it 
now, when you ship, I would say most of the development team has it typically most of the development team has not played it start to finish. I mean, uh, I had played it start to finish and a few other people had, and then we had testers who had and, and um, people at the publisher who had, but most of the artists, you know, most of the programmers, et cetera, have not, or even a bunch of the designers have probably not played it start to finish. Are you ready for the big bad Air Force question? Yeah, I think you'll be disappointed in my answer, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Do you, I'm guessing you don't know anything about the deal. That's right. I don't know anything about the deal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like we were talking about sort of in the pre-call uh, period, you know, Midway was, I'm sure it was the right price for <laughs> the right stuff that the Army wanted. And I mean, part, I think back then, you know, the Army, oh, the Army and the Armed Forces in general are always looking at new ways to recruit um, young people, right? You know, right. 18 years old. And I'm sure at the time, and they, before that, you know, there was that Army game. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, I kind of vaguely remember it was, that. It was funded by the military, and yeah. it was like a first-person shooter, but All told from a very pro-U.S. Army. And you would play, it was multiplayer, but you would always be the American side, and the other side would look like the enemies. It would just swap the character models out, I think. Um, anyway, like they had done that, and that cost a certain amount of money, right? And they decided they got whatever promotional value they got out of that, and then they said, maybe we could just license. I'd, this would be my guess, it's pure speculation. Maybe, what if we just bought some games and gave them away for free, and people had to give us their email address to get them, or whatever you had to do. Um, I didn't get them that way, and, uh, and it just happened. And I was, you know, when that deal happened, you know, I don't remember if I was still at Midway at that point. Or if I even, like, it's one of those things, like, I heard, oh, they gave it away. Well, that's cool. More people playing it. You know, because, you know, you want, for me anyway, I want people to buy the game because that means I get to make another one. And people will see, uh, you know, that it can be a profitable thing. And so maybe we'll let them make another game. But uh, there's also, you know, at a, at a more raw level, it's not about getting money for it. It's about getting people to play it. So if, you know, millions of people downloaded it from the Navy website years later and played it, that's awesome. Like I'm totally in favor. Um, like on a, in a pure level, I'd just give it away, but obviously, you know, better that Midway got some money out of it so that that could be a viable model. So other things can be made. Right. Do you have anybody, you know, that I could reach out to about it? <laughs> um, not really. It was so long ago, too. What was there something in particular you wanted to know about it? I was just I'm I'm curious about their their thought processes with what games they decide to give out because there's <laughs> right. there, there was a comment. What were on, the What were the other games? You know, it was I, I I read some saw something on Reddit or whatnot that it was the Suffering One, which I knew about, the Suffering Two, Ties That Bind, and then Area Fifty One. All from Midway. Mm-hmm. Um, that Area 51 game had uh, David Duchovny in it. That's right. Another game I'm that correct. I actually wound, I actually wound up picking that up at a Walmart or something uh, back in the day. And somebody was Marilyn like, Manson too. David Duchovny and Marilyn Manson. And I was like, they're yeah. trying to tell us something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I'll tell you though. I think you know if I were to find someone who had something to do with that deal, and there is one person I could message who might remember, and I'll I'll try to do that. And I actually was just talking to him about something else in the last few weeks, so it won't be totally out of the blue. But um, there's often like not a lot of thought. <laughs> like you try to, why did you do this? People are like, I don't know. You know, I knew this guy from golfing, and then we did this deal, and I had these games, and Midway needed money, so the price was low, and you know they thought, oh, these are the ones that. You know, actually have PC versions. So I think, like, you know, another game that came out around the same time as us was like the Midway Sports games, like Ballers or um, Blitz the League or something like that. And, uh, or like PsyOps. And those games didn't have PC versions, they only had console versions. So, and then the Navy was probably thinking, well, we just want them to be a download off a website. Obviously, you can't, a freebie for a console is a whole other level of complexity. Like you got to actually back then you'd have to make a disc and who still has that console. Whereas here we got PC versions of these games. Right. Here's, here's, you know, XCX thousand dollars to, uh, 
to license them for this download thing. We've got these games, and certainly back then, too, you know, the tail on games was much shorter. So, you know, people wouldn't think, oh, we're really, you know, by that point, Midway was making close to zero money off of those titles. Um, so they're like, hey, this this will be a good deal for us. We'll get a little bit of money. The Navy will get to promote its stuff. These are the ones we have. You know, we don't have any others. And doing like EA would probably not want to do it because they're too big, you know, or something. And they'd, they'd say, let's get more money out of this or let's do it ourselves or whatever. Um, so it's probably just the uh, right time, right place, small amount of money in the grand scheme of things exchanged hands. That would be my guess. I read that there was a potential for a movie being developed. Do you know how far that got along? Do you know why it fell apart? Yeah, I think it fell apart because almost all movies fall apart. But um, um, yeah, mid uh, MTV was at the time Midway was owned by um, was a public company, but a large portion of the stock was owned by Sumner Redstone, who also owned Paramount, which owned MTV, I think. Something like that. Um, and so I think there was some, he was like looking to acquire maybe Midway, which didn't end up happening at the time. But um, I think he was trying to get synergies between his different companies. So it was then he, it's, it's in some fashion, I'm not saying he did it directly, but, you know, his people are like, oh, we should get Midway to, you know, license some games to MTV Films, who's trying to make movies. Um, and I don't know that MTV, MTV Films ever went on to make and MTV Films was like some subsection of Paramount. I don't think they ended up making horror movies, really. Uh, I think they made mostly comedies. But um, yeah, there was, I did talk to a guy from MTV Films who was looking to develop it, and they were getting screenwriters involved. And um, it kind of, and there were rumors about who was cast, but I think those are only rumors. I don't think it ever got to the casting stage. Um, I think they were trying to find a script they liked. And I, Coincidentally, I was at a writer's conference um, with s some novelists there, and uh, I was met one of them. I was like, oh, what have you done? Oh, I, well, I wrote this, you know, in addition to other things, I wrote this game, The Suffering. He's like, oh, I pitched for that. I was like, huh? You know, in, in Hollywood, you know, when you're, you often, as a writer, take a lot of meetings where someone is like, hey, we have this property we want to make into a movie. What would you do with it? And then you pitch them something, and then they say, "Great, go write that up as a script," and that's when they pay you money oh, okay. um, for the pitch meeting. It's you know they don't pay you anything, so you often have to do this sort of free work to say, "Oh, here's the thing. What would you do with it?" And then you like give them you know a couple of paragraphs off the top of your heads or prepared about what you would do. And I remember he was saying he wanted to change it into a Native American burial ground or something, and I was like, "Oh God, thank God you didn't make this." Um, nice guy though and it, you know it's this weird like they would often you know who knows what they even gave him about the game or if he'd seen the game probably not you know he probably just had like a one page summary of the game and was like oh well what I would do with it is this and that's why often when you see particularly 10-15 years ago when you would see the movie version of a game it would have barely anything to do with the game you know and because uh, that was the the thought was, well, we've got this property, but we don't actually need to be true to it. And then the same thing with when they adapt novels into movies, too. It's, it's like seen as the starting point for some concept, and then they just do their own thing with it. And then you always wonder, why did you even bother licensing it? Because uh, it's so different. Um, and that's changed a bit with like comic book adaptations and stuff, where they have tried to be to stick to like the original characters and, and the original things that made those comic books interesting. That, that was less the case 20 years ago. Um, so anyway, yes, a movie did, did exist on in development. And then as far as I know, just never made it out of development. Uh, what are some things you do differently or would improve upon with some of the modern technology we have today? If you were to be making this project right now, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, you know, it's I, it's funny when you when I think back about it, it always looks better in my mind than it actually did look, um, because you kind of when you see a game on the in that era of PS2 or whatever, um, you know, where the fidelity was getting better, but it was still not that great. Um, you tend to your mind tends to fill in the the things that are actually bad, um, fill in the gaps a little bit. 
or just, yeah, I mean, you're sort of, it's sort of like reading a book, you imagine all the characters, right? When you're looking at a low fidelity game, you start imagining the world as being better looking than it is. Um, and it was funny, like the second game looks a lot better than the first game, but is worse in almost every other way, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and you'd think, well, they made it better. Why couldn't they keep it the same? But sometimes when you, the things you do to make the game look better, make it harder to make the game, um, because it takes you so long to make it look better. You can make fewer areas now, or you can't do dynamic light anymore because the shadows are all baked or things like that. And there were a lot of concessions made in the second game to make it look better. And, um, that the detriment of the gameplay for, I mean, I'm not saying that's the only reason the game was worse, but it's certainly one of them. And, you um sadly then people will often say oh yeah they looked about the same like, they don't even notice that it's better <laughs> looking you know because they just assumed it was better looking than it was if they actually went back and looked at the old one they'd say oh that looked much worse than the second one but i remember it as looking better anyway you know so a lot of it you know, if I were to to make another one or or remake it or something, would just be making it look as good as games can look now. Like having really good fog effects would be really good. For example, on on Incarnate Island, like we had some pretty limited ones, but it wasn't amazing. Um, you know, the I'm trying to think of other. You know, we were constantly fighting with memory limitations on the PS2 of like how much stuff we could have loaded at any time. And that would result in some kind of weird designs that would snake you through things. But again, we were in a prison, so it kind of made sense. But some of that you could just make the game without having to worry about that quite as much. Um, and then just make stuff look better. In terms of the, you know, I would probably, I think, of the characters in that first game, probably Clem is my least favorite in terms of the voice performance and the writing. I would say the writing first that led to the voice performance. And I was directing it, so it's my fault. But uh, <laughs> he's a little too like Colonel Sanders or Foghorn uh, <laughs> Leghorn. Is the other one that comes up a lot. So I would have a more nuanced Southerner uh, for that character, for sure. Um so little things like that that would be changed. Um, but I tend to not, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about theoreticals like that unless until they're happening or something. So if we were actually making a new one, I would go through and figure out what could be better. Um, certainly like the controls could be a lot better by modern standards than they, than they, like I think they were pretty good for the time, but they weren't as good as controls are now. Just because we've learned more about how to make a dual stick game work. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's lots of lots of potential for things to change, but I don't know that I have a, a dream wish list of it, other other than Foghorn Leghorn. It's it's really funny that you mentioned uh, Colonel Sanders because I was like I said I was watching and listening to it uh, to it yesterday just as a, a refresher for uh, the interview of today. And uh, Clem came up on the screen, and I just—it was—it was during that moment where he's uh, kind of in the background, and you're seeing him through like a, a gap in the cave or something like that. And I just—I was kind of watching at the time. I saw him pop. I was like, "Was that Colonel Sanders?" <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Like I don't hate him. I don't think he ruins the game, but it would definitely be a redo on him a bit. Uh, do you see any future for the game series? I know. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's hard to, I think, yeah, you know, as you probably know, it's not like I own it myself or something. Um, I think it all, I think all of the Midway stuff went to Warner Brothers or something like that. I believe that is correct. Um, and they recently re-released it on GOG in the last year, so you can go buy the, the two games on GOG now, which was, you know, for a decade, there was nowhere you could purchase the game. Um, yeah, and you can't. It's uh, the the advertisement servers are down too, so you can't can't even use the free version anymore. Oh, right, right. So was that how the Navy version worked? It had ads that popped up on the front screen or something. I think so. I don't. I don't. I don't vividly remember there any ads showing up, but I. But I you just know it won't run. Yeah, I tr I try to get the try to download and get it to run, and it wouldn't run. Right. 
But hey. got to spend the ten bucks on GOG, I guess, or wait till, for it to be on sale for half that or something. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that a modern version of it would do pretty well if done right. Um, like I think people who are into horror stuff, like there's a pretty even more than when it came out. There's more horror games out there that are doing pretty well. Um, Outlast and Agony and stuff like that. Yeah, or like, like Dead, Dead by Daylight, Daylight or, um, yeah, the the frictional games, Amnesia and Soma and stuff, um, or the Killing Floor or whatever. You know, and there's just a you know there uh, obviously a variety of those that are more straight up like horror horror and those that are like shooters with a horror setting or whatever. And as I said before, the suffering sort of a shooter with a horror setting. Um, so yeah, I mean, it feels like it compete. It feels like it does things that those other games don't do that people would be into. Um, yeah. So I, if the opportunity arose to do another one, I'd be happy to, but I don't know that it will. Would you want to do a remaster? Possibly, um, just so that people could play it without seeing the ugliness. Um, I definitely like I like remasters that really feel like the original game when possible. Um, and there are some that are just like we've basically remade this game entirely or something, and it ends up feeling a little worse or junkier or something like that. Um, so it'd be great to do it that felt as good as the original, but then just looked better. Um, Maybe redo Clem too, or not. Maybe leave him in so it's authentic. I don't know. Um, but maybe, maybe do both versions. Yeah, I'm not like I'm not dying for there to be a remake either, because I kind of like, you know, if someone wanted to do it, great. I would happily help in any way I could. But um, I'm also not opposed to things sort of staying in the time when they were created. You know, that you go look at like an old. Um, game from the 80s or something that has a very pixely look or whatever and it's kind of cool that it looks like that and I don't want it to have 3D models instead of 2D pixel art um, so I'm okay and I feel the same way about you know PS2 era game has a certain low fidelity look to stuff that uh, it's just how games look then it's like I don't want my black and white movies to be colorized either that's fair but, but in this case you know, it'd be cool that it just ran better on modern hardware. Because unlike a movie, like a movie, you can watch exactly the same way it was originally released, right? Whereas a game, often you can't play it because there's some bugs or some hardware thing, or the console that run it no longer works. You know, so you know, it'd be great to have the game on a PS4 or an Xbox One or something that that you can just play there because it is, as you know, much as it works on a PC as well, it was a console game first and foremost. Uh, the the suffering too. You said it was worse. Uh, <laughs> is that your personal opinion, or is that just you know you read all the reviews and they were worse, or? Well, the reviews were worse a bit, yeah, but not that much worse actually. Um, I felt it was, and the things it was dinged for were, um, yeah, I guess I have personal things I don't like about it as much as the first one. Like, I don't like everything I've done, right? Like, I know there's things I don't like about the first game, too. But um, there's a little bit more about the second game. And the reviews complaints were the game wasn't, didn't have as much stuff as the first game. Like, it was physically a smaller, like, if you took out the number of square meters in the game that the player could go to, there are less of them in the second game. I would guess about two-thirds. But the way that was made up for was having a lot more combat in those spaces that would just go on and on and on and sometimes too far. So that was probably the biggest problem um, was just the sort of monotony of the shootouts. Um, and then, like, we added things like lockers where you could get infinite ammo from so that you could do those infinite shootouts in those limited number of spaces. Um, and it became more of a shooter and less, even less horror, it felt like. Um, so I don't like that. For me, too, the um, it had the military force in it that was brought in by Jordan, who is the, the leader um, of them. And I, I, don't, I never felt like she worked out completely from a writing standpoint or an acting standpoint. Or it has this uh, 
when I was watching it yesterday, it kind of had, she had this weird turnaround where she was like, keep him safe, now I'm going to help him, and then you meet her at the prison and she like 180s and it's like, I want to kill you now. Yeah, yeah, I don't know that she had as much time to be developed as she needed, I guess I'd say, in terms of like, I think there could be, a, I think you could go, if you had time to go back for one more voice acting pass, um, or possibly just redo her voice completely, um, if you had time for that. Uh, and I thought the actress who did her is a phenomenal actress. Um, and I think if we'd gone a different direction with the performance in the studio, it could have been, she could have done a great job. Um, but yeah, so I don't think she worked out and I don't think I didn't ever, and I didn't not end up liking having as many military characters in the game as there were. Um, it just felt like it distracted from, you know, the game was sort of, it should have been more about Baltimore city streets stuff than, Oh, it's Baltimore city with this horror stuff. Oh, and this military thing too. It just felt like one thing too many that distracted away from, uh, what the game could have been and sort of being more about urban blight and stuff. Um, so yeah, I I probably would have, you know, the, um, show the wire. If you know that show, also set in Baltimore. I actually watched after the game was done. Um, and just showed me more stuff about Baltimore than I knew before and the way they did housing projects and stuff. Because we had talked about doing an actual housing project as a location, but ended up not doing it. And I feel like that was a missed opportunity. Uh, I also saw the movie Candyman, if you've ever seen that. Oh, man, Candyman. That's, that's a fun movie. I love that movie. Um, one of my favorite horror movies. And I only saw that after... The suffering, the second suffering game was done. It, it was, it was from ten years earlier, but I'd just never seen it. I thought it was a dopey, you know, Chucky movie or something. Um, and it's, it's not. It's like one of the smarter horror, like popular horror movies I can think of. But um, that had housing projects in it. It was set in Chicago, and the way those are portrayed in that felt very realistic, but also horrifying. And it was like, God, how did we not do that? <laughs> so that, that like, uh, it was in the plans, but then it's just like, oh, the art's hard to do. And, you know, housing projects, these giant buildings, how are we going to do that? And it, you, I think you would have to be smart about how you did it, but I, I wish we had. So a couple of missed opportunities and maybe spending too much time on the military stuff. Um, and then the the sort of endless combat cycles, uh, all of that could be different. So could be a little bit more streamlined and get you through it a little bit quicker. I don't think a short game is a problem, as long as that short mm. game is you know really impactful. You know. Yeah, it's definitely tough. You know, when someone spends sixty bucks on a game, um, and it's not a game with multiplayer <laughs> or something, right? You know, I think you, you owe them a certain length of time, or the expectation is certainly that they're going to get 15 hours out of it or something. Um, and if you're, and that's, you know, and that, that has changed a bit since then that you can now sell a game for 30 bucks on Steam or whatever and yeah. have it be shorter and people aren't, or like Portal is a great example of a shorter game that I don't feel needs anything added to it. And indeed, like Portal 2, which I also like quite a bit felt like they were kind of padding it to make it a longer game at times. Um, when the first game just feels like it's exactly the right length at four hours or whatever it is. So. What is your favorite enemy from the second game? I know that I really thought the uh, the design on the gun spider. Uh, oh, right. I thought that was wild. <laughs> yeah, the... Um, the main one I remember liking is the guys who uh, I, I haven't uh, looked them up in a while, and I can't remember what they're called. But they're guards who have like a flashlight in their head, and oh. or they're like reincarnated guards, and they sort of pull themselves around the ground, and then they're like a turret sort of yeah. enemy. Yeah, I remember those. Um, that was one of my favorite. I just pulled out my uh, Suffering Two strategy guide here. Oh. Which is how I remember the names of characters. Uh, da, 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 I'd the say the, Trigger Man. One of the creepier designs to me was the uh, the dogs with the human head and a knife oh, yes. to their face. 
Yeah. Like oh, the suppressor. suppressor. That's what the, the guys with the flashlight and the guns growing out of them and they're missing their legs and they pull themselves around on their butts. Love those guys. Um, but yeah, the, the mauler, that was the name of the dog. I thought those dog human good. and that was a that was a ben olsen special like he had been he had a whole comic book he'd drawn about dogs with human heads <laughs> like not a horror thing just a weird messed up comic book you know like sort of indie comic book sort of look and uh we were like well we got and i just said well ben we're getting your dogs with human heads here we go <laughs> so, that's another i mean it fit with the uh the character who was their boss? Uh, the, the slave hunter. Yes, the slave hunter guy. Not the creeper. Uh, I'm looking in the thing now. Yeah, that see. weird flasher guy. Yeah, the creeper was the flasher guy. I think he was. I think he was the the spookier of the two. Not gonna oh, lie. God, yeah, he was awful. Uh, Easily the most disturbing character ever been involved with now when i was watching that playthrough were those two different characters copperfield that was the name of the, the uh wasn't that his name the the slave hunter like that. so name were those Cop two uh i always saw the one playthrough um because i didn't have as much time as i would have liked yesterday but uh were those two, were there two different boss fights planned, and you do one if you have a good karma and one if you have a bad karma? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there were two implemented, and then uh, you you get one on one path and one on the other. Okay. And that was again trying to make there be more variety to to playing it twice, so you'd have more reason to do it. I'm not sure it was worth it in the end. It might have been better to just have both and both and have something else be different, but. Um, we didn't also didn't spend as much time making those boss fights as good as the boss fights from the first game, but which again I don't think are the best part of the first game either. Like our boss fights are always a weakness, but uh, like you had the the Horus one that was cool with the electricity, and then Killjoys with the projectors you had to destroy and the respawning. Like those felt like they were richly integrated with the characters and stuff, whereas and the environments that you fought them in. Whereas if I recall, you fight both Copperfield and the Creeper in the same location that is sort of tied to neither of them as a result. And they're just sort of like, they spawn stuff at you and are bullet sponges or something. So, Yeah. I do remember the Hermes fight and you, uh, I think it's just cranking the valves. Right, you're trying to control where his, his gas is going or something like that. Uh, probably the weakest of the of the ones in that game, but still pretty good. I th I think it works thematically though. I think, I think yeah, really no, it totally does. Yeah, you know, not every you know quote unquote boss fight has to be a physical fight. It could just be a you know using the right tactics and using a using your you know using it as a puzzle instead. I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, any questions that you want people to ask you, like when you, when you were you know, maybe in the post-process of the game or, you know, maybe doing interviews with other outlets and stuff like that. Was there anything you wanted somebody to ask you specifically? Um, not really. The, uh, I definitely enjoyed the process of those interviews. And when people would say, oh, I was playing it and I thought this, or I was playing it and I got this thing, um, you know, I would always be delighted by how those turned, the things people would pick up on that I hadn't necessarily been expecting. Um, so that was, that was always rewarding when people would, would bring up stuff that I that I was thinking but hadn't said explicitly and they would have figured some part of it out or hearing like, well, thematically, I think the game is like this. Um, so I feel like that some of that really went well. And some of that, um, particularly on the second game, because people had played the first game already and then were coming to look at the second game, having played the first one, there were a lot of cool conversations that came out of that. Um, so no, and I feel like your questions were great. So, oh, I'm, I'm glad to have supplied you with some invigorating questions 
I, I I had another question about suffering too. I just remembered it. Mm -hmm. Um, that was kind of uh, again one of those kind of audience interpretation questions. You know, uh, was there any thought about uh, how it is for uh, people that were in the system coming back into their uh, coming back into their neighborhoods and struggling to succeed afterwards? Do you have any plans or ideas for that? Was it was that in your mindset at all when you were making the second game? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely the idea was that he had been to prison before. It was never really said why. Um, and that just sort of portraying the reality that, that I had seen reported many times of you know, if you're growing up in a group home, as Torque did, you know, you're not getting the sort of parental support that you get if you're fortunate enough to have parents. Um, and you're not set in an environment where you're going to a school that's well-funded and you're not set in a place where you have, you know, if Torque wanted to get, you know, as, as a kid wanted to get into tech or something, like, who would he even talk to about that? How That seems impossible, right? right. Um, whereas someone who comes, you know, lives in a more affluent area, goes to a school that has... Um, you know, a, a computer science department or something, right? And like growing up for me, my best friend's uh, father was a computer science professor. So it was like, and he had already taught his son how to program and his son taught me how to program. And it was just a thing that just happened as easy as anything, right? Because I was interested in it and the opportunities were there. And certainly seeing... Um, you know, what, how do people end up in prison again and again? It's often that, you know, they don't see any route to financial stability other than some sort of criminal endeavor or half criminal endeavor or something and or even get caught up in things they didn't do because there's so much crime in their neighborhood and the city's having a crackdown or whatever. And, um, you know, just try and not, you know, obviously a lot of bad people in prison too and, you know, people making awful choices that they, they, they need to be that need to be put away to keep the rest of us safe and stuff like that. But seeing, you know, someone like Torque who, you know, again, like the player could play in a very murderous way and kill every friendly person they meet in the game. And then they get the endings they get. But, you know, in the other endings, Torque is obviously someone trying to do the best in a bad situation um, throughout his life. So, yeah, I mean, definitely trying to, create a character that the players could sympathize with, but who also wasn't necessarily like them. The gray area, the gray area of society. Or just who had a, you know, an upbringing. Cause a lot of the people playing, I don't know it, that's not true. Actually. Um, you know, I was going to say a lot of the people who can afford a video game console and a game for it, you know, have money, but then, uh, you know, then you have people like yourself, who not commenting on your financial situation, but a lot of people who got this game for free after the fact because you know well, they've got an old PC they can run it on and they, the the Navy's given it away, um, so it was cool to get them to play it. But then also you know thinking of other people who maybe are more well off playing this might make them think twice about you know the type of people in prison or whatever, or or how hard it is to grow up in that environment uh, through the second game kind of like the the attitudes portrayed in the the really start of the first game where you have the one guy that's really demonizing torque for what he did whereas the other guy is like you know he kind of had a really bad trial and it's not you know right you know it's all yep. up to interpretation and then you've got the one guy who's a nazi and the one guy who's a pedophile and then the and then Hajira, and then you've got or no Hajira is in the second game. I can't remember the name of the guy, the two other characters. Was, uh, Slick and oh right, Slick. Uh, who was the the thinner dude, the thinner black yeah. dude, and then yeah, the, the Jerry Curl. And then yeah, I'm I'm blanking on the other guy's name, and I just yeah. rewatched it. <laughs> but it was cool when you know. I mean, some of my favorite things that have happened you know, being in the industry is like people who are like, I remember the suffering that had a black guy in it and I didn't get to play any other games with black guys in them. And it's coming from African American, uh, people who are now game developers or media people or whatever. Um, and saying that, you know, cause I'm not African American myself, Obviously. but tr trying to, well, you know, if you haven't seen a picture, who knows, but, uh, uh, trying to, 
it was it was cool that and I, I didn't even think of it that way at the time but it was just like well what statistically you know the prisons are much fuller of minorities than they are of of caucasians so it, you know having torque be of unknown ethnicity but not lily white either um made sense and particularly for someone who is potentially wrongly uh in there um so it was cool that people saw that and reacted to it and told me about it years later do you think that that aspect of representation is important nowadays i know there's a lot of people that are just like oh it's not important we only use i don't i guess i guess i think if you're setting a game in the real world you should make it look like the real world and not some version that is mysteriously leave some whole group out or something like that right so i don't see it as we must fill the games with all diverse characters by this quota or something but it's like you know i did a game before this that was set in the military and the military has a large minority population larger than the rest of the population uh, the, the, vol- the modern vol- volunteer military has more minority representation than the rest of society. So the game re- represented that, you know, reflected that in the, the characters you were playing uh, and the characters that were your teammates and stuff. So it wasn't like I'm trying to get more more different folks in here. It was like, well, what's the military look like? Okay, you got all these types of people. Let's put them all in the game. So, and I feel like making a game set in a prison, same thing applies. But if I was making a game about, you know, homesteading in Oklahoma or not, homesteading in Nebraska in the, you know, uh, 1840s or something, uh, it wouldn't necessarily make as much sense. But it could fit in as well and could be could be interesting if you did have it. But it wouldn't be like wrong to not have it either. Is there anything that you learned from developing the suffering that influenced you in other games that you created afterwards? Sure. <laughs> That's a long question, though. I mean, it's every every game you learn a ton of stuff from, right? Um, I guess the the one thing I'd say is that that was for some for whatever reason, it was one of the best developments I've been involved with in terms of, hey, we're gonna make this game. Okay, we're still making that game. Okay, here's this game. Let's add a few things to it. Okay, then we shipped it. You know, and it wasn't like. Oh God, what are we doing? Throw it all away, you know, months of wasted work. Um, and it was fortunate. And I don't think that, you know, when that happens, I'm not saying those people messed up. It was just, we were fortunate that from the beginning we had an idea that people liked and it was something we could do. And, uh, we were able to do it because so often either you have a game that everybody likes but it's way too ambitious and then you have to cut it down and you end up losing some stuff or you have a game that you like but turns out other people don't like it so then you have to adjust if you're going to support you know trying to sell as many copies you have to sell to make back your money um and this just sort of was a lucky time where we had a pitch that people liked and we had a game that and we were able to make that game are you glad that that somebody's talking about the suffering again Sure, you know these sort of things pop up every couple of months, often that that somebody wants to talk about the suffering. Either they're just asking a one-off question, or it's an interview sort of thing. And it was funny, I guess, that it definitely went away for a while. Like it had, you know, when it came out, but then there wasn't social media, so how would anyone ever find me? And then there was, um, um, you know, the free version came out. But then it kind of like, I didn't hear much about the suffering for five, a good five years or something. Like there would be a few things pop up here and there, but not much. And then it feels like it's ramped up in the last five years or so of people asking about it or it's showing up on someone's best of list of four games or, or whatnot. So, or fondly remembered PS2 games or whatever. So it's cool that it has sort of passed a cusp of, it's kind of a nostalgia thing now for people. And so they want to talk about it again, again, which is cool. Must be feel pretty rewarding. Yeah, yeah. And you know, in the moment when it came out, it was um, not universally loved. I would say, like, it, it reviewed okay, but not sensationally. But I remember uh, EGM Electronic Gaming Monthly gave it a three point five out of ten or something, and they were one of the bigger magazines at the time. 
And I was like, what game did you? And they were just mad it wasn't Japanese, it seemed like. <laughs> and I was like, this review is terrible. Like, screw these people forever. The GM game? said to me, you know, they've gone out of business since then. So, so it's all fine. But uh, <laughs> just remember that review. And it still it scars me to this day because they were a really big magazine and they hate it. So I can, I can definitely relate to that, you know. <laughs> but in time, whatever the hangups they had, nobody comes anyone who comes and talks to me now liked it right like people who hated it have gone on to hate something else or whatever right they're not remembering a game they hated 10 years ago or 15 years ago yeah better to better to fill your life with positivity right when you can when you can cool thank you thank you again I really thank you enjoyed it looking forward to the video as i said talk to you later Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Let's talk about some of the challenges behind this interview now that it's over. As soon as I had decided that I wanted to do a video about the suffering, I wanted to see what some of the history of the game was, so that I could possibly put some more of that information into the video. While I wound up not doing that as much as I had originally wanted, I still really valued the experience. But how hard was it? Well, Twitter actually came in really handy here. I asked another person over Twitter about it and they pointed me towards Richard Rouse. From there we arranged a date to do it. In the meantime, I had to come up with the questions. Some of them were things I wanted to know for a while, such as the Air Force connection with the game being released for free. Others are questions I came up with after going through the story again and thinking about things on other levels other than just the basic game design. From there we just did a call via Skype, I recorded it through OBS and voila. We have this video now. Overall, I think it turned out pretty well. It was a really rewarding experience. Now, the audio balance is a bit weird. Richard Rouse's audio is a lot louder than mine in the interview. So I separated out most of my audio and put it on a separate audio track and then boosted mostly the whole line. Wherever there is overlap between us, I usually air downwards so that there's not too much distortion. A little bit of work, but I wanted to make sure as much of the audio as possible was easy to listen to. I did a few cuts here and there for some stuff that was off topic or shortening some of the longer gaps, but I kept the audio as pure as possible. With all that said, follow my Twitter I guess. I've been posting there more and more, you can find the link down in the description. Other than that, answer the poll, create a flamethrower, stomp around on the ceiling, cartwheel on bladed limbs, transform into a hideous rage monster and make the Hulk jealous. After all, he doesn't have a blade hand. What a peasant.